different families and they come from origin. So you can sometimes see very similar kinds of dynamics, particularly, let's say, in a lesbian couple where one is um, uh, attempting pregnancy with her own eggs uh, and the other, um, you know, is, is it can be more in that role of being more the observer, like in the heterosexual couple where the male partner is the observer. Uh, and, um, I've worked with, uh, lesbian couples before where that's been one of the dynamics about, you know, one tends to be much more of a feeler and the other tends to be much more kind of a doer. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so how do you, how do you, um, understand and work through these relationships? these kinds of issues within the relationship. You can also have situations with, with like lesbian couples where they're both going through treatment in the sense that they are uh, doing what we call co-IVF. One is um, going through IVF in order to give her eggs to her partner for her partner to carry the baby. So they have that shared experience and they're using a sperm donor. So then they're both kind of getting their bodies ready for this and they can be dealing with similar kinds of emotions at the same time. It, it, it's kind of hard to make generalizations across the lines about that because I think it has very much to do with just couple dynamics and helping people learn how to appreciate the differences with each other. Uh, um, with, with single women, it's, it's different. And, and they are, have an enormous need for support. And uh, it's and crucially important that they have... Um, people within their lives, friends and family that can help them, and also um, other women who have been through this to help. Uh, we have a, 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 a single woman support group uh, that we do at Shady Grove Fertility, um, and it, we usually have 20 to 30 women who come to this, and they come not only when they're considering treatment, but when they're pregnant and they come afterwards, and they really have built a community for themselves. Uh, and this community um, acts as a family and helps them as they struggle with their, if they need help with injections, you know, we have someone that will come over, you know, one of their friends that they've met in the group will come over. So, um, building in this kind of community is, is important, uh, not only in helping them through treatment, but, you know, in raising families as time goes on. You've been listening to Sharon Covington discuss the stress that can happen in relationships when a couple is going through infertility or fertility challenges. I'm Kimberly Lipschus for Pregnancy Birth and Beyond and stay tuned for some more interviews. talking about when couples undergo assisted reproductive technologies such as IVF there's actually an added string to the bow of their experience because they are medical technologies and every person needs to feel that they're important when they're going undergoing something like a fertility challenge and and that their experiences are heard and that they're valid women but also men too as you will hear I think the relationship with the, the doctor and the healthcare providers it can be a crucial piece in how people experience this. Because if they have doctors who are sensitive, compassionate, responsive, or, and nurses and laboratory people, there's many people who are involved in this process, uh, it, it, it takes a lot of the stress away. When they feel like they are just a number and they're being moved through or people don't remember their history as they're talking to them, then um, it really uh, adds to the negativity of the experience. Yeah. And, and in a practice like mine, we are a very big medical practice. It's very easy for something like that to happen, but we work very hard in different ways to keep that from happening so that, that people feel that each person that walks through the door is an individual that is important to the practice. And that is absolutely vital, and it's a theme that seems to come up time and time again. And it's not... It's, it's, it's not any fault of a medical practitioner. Usually it's their, their time constraint and they're pressured as well. Um, and, but there is a lot of uh, women and couples who say, 
that they feel that they talked over them or that they were talk, discussing a protocol they were going to use while they had their legs open and, and, and that, that they find that very painful and it adds to their um, stress of the experience. I think I think you've made a very good point. That's not certainly uh, uh, an unusual comment that you will hear from people about how dehumanizing it is. We were talking about bringing the men and their experience into it. And one thing that I find um, that gets ignored is, especially when men have to do a sperm test, how clinicalized that is. And when it comes to IVF, there's only one thing that a man has to do in this process. And that's to produce the sperm, you know, the semen sample. And, uh, you know, women in, you know, in order to have, an, uh, you know, to have, can have sex and be thinking about their laundry list. They don't have to have an orgasm in order to make conception take place, but a man does. And that puts tremendous uh, stress on him. And so it is not uncommon for them to come in to this, as you say, very kind of stark background with materials that in other situations they're not really supposed to, quote unquote, supposed to enjoy uh, without their partner. And um, it's, it's, it's on demand, it's sex on demand, and it can create its own stresses. And at times men aren't able to you know, produce a semen sample. Now, there are other things that can be done. I mean, it can be done at home where it can be transported to the office so that his wife can be there and be a part of it. There are times that even the wife can be in the room with him if he needs to be there. So it certainly is up to the clinic to, um, you know, if men have any concern about whether they're going to be able to do this, again, it's not unusual. It's not rare. It does happen. Uh, but um, they need to be talking to their um, you know, healthcare provider about uh, ways to um, address this uh, until waiting till the last minute when they have to walk into the room. <laughs> yeah, because it's easy to sideline that that single need that they want, that like you were saying, and to belittle it. Because when uh, you know a, a woman to go, well, I've gone through this and this and this, and here's my litany in my list. You just have to ejaculate into a cup. How hard can it be? And and that yeah. that has a a huge impact on a man because it is hard and, and, and I think it's important that you say that you've said that, that this is a very difficult, intimidating process for them too. I think, again, we have to appreciate, appreciate the stresses that men are put through uh, in this kind of situation. Again, it often gets marginalised and kind of put to the side. And uh, I think in working with couples, that's one of the things we talk about, that they have to appreciate that this is stressful uh, for their husband and can be difficult. Sharon Covington talking about fertility and the stress on the relationship. It's very hard, actually, when you're lost on the path of infertility. As a woman, as a couple, no matter what your sexual persuasion, it's a level playing field. But how can you re reconnect with your loved one when trying to get pregnant and when it's, that actually becomes the main driver of your life? What happens for Sharon when someone calls her as a potential client? First of all, I should say one of the things that I always try to do when even when I have a woman call and saying, I'm having a terrible time, my husband is doing fine, I'm having a terrible time, uh, I'd like to come in and speak with you. I always encourage the husband to come in because they can frequently be really forgotten in this process. I think it also is an opportunity to help him with, you know, understanding strategies of what's going on with her. Um, I help them kind of look back in, in, in times in their relationship where that it was they felt particularly close or it was particularly fun. What were the things they were doing and how can they do that again? Um, doing things like uh, planning a date night. It is amazing to me how many couples get so busy with their work and their fertility treatment, they forget how to have fun. So, um, you know, identifying uh, ways that um, or things that they would like to do together or helping the partner identify what their, their other partner would want to do and make that happen is kind of a gift. So date nights, a lot of reconnecting when, when there's uh, women and couples in this situation, a lot of uh, intimacy that may not be sexual as well. Is, are they some of the things you would say to reconnect and just drop into each other um, as a couple? Yeah, absolutely. To find ways to have fun together, uh, to um, feel close, to feel intimate without it being related to making a baby. 
Uh, even when it comes times that they need to make a baby, sometimes separating the rooms that they do that. They have one room that is their baby making room and their other room that's their love making room. Uh, so really trying to put some boundaries around the fertility challenges that they're having uh, in order to remember why they're doing it in the first place. What brought them together in the first place? And the importance of this relationship, uh, not only at this point in time, but as they go forward in the future with their family. Sharon, thank you so much. That's been really, really helpful. I really appreciate it. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on this, Kimberly. We hope you've enjoyed this week's Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond show. Tune in next week for more radical and soulful radio bringing us full circle. Our radio show now has a Facebook page. Take a peek, say hello, become a fan and stay up to date with the show. Go to facebook.com forward slash pregnancy birth and beyond radio.